then after that he decided to get a master's degree and uh, he made it out to the University of Oregon where he did a master's degree there and uh, began coaching at Cottage Grove, Oregon, which is a fairly good sized community but just south of Eugene, I guess, a little bit. And, and there he had a, an outstanding athlete, had some, some great teams, but one athlete in particular was Daryl Burleson, who was probably the best high school miler of that era. And uh, uh, Burleson ended up going to University of Oregon in Eugene, and Coach Bell ended up getting hired at Oregon State at about the same time, about the time that he finished high school. And uh, so then he coached at Oregon State for a number of years. Uh, while he was there, he, uh, they won the only national championship Oregon State had ever won in anything until about two years ago when they won the baseball championship. But they, they won the NCAA Cross Country Championship at, at Oregon State University. Um, he then uh, had the opportunity to go to a little bigger school, maybe a little more prestigious school, the University of California at Berkeley, when a, a man named Brutus Hamilton, and you read the book, I know that he's a chapter in the book of, about the uh, philosopher coaches. And uh, so he took over for Brutus Hamilton at University of California uh, and, and had some outstanding teams there. Was there during the 60s, and he'll maybe tell you about some of the turbulent times that it, it was in the 60s, particularly at Berkeley, trying to do anything, let alone you know coach track. Um, in about 69, he left Berkeley, had the opportunity to come here to Indiana and coach uh, here at Indiana until his retirement. Uh, starting out, the indoor track was right outside this door here. Uh, at that time, the, the field house where the indoor track is now was, the, was where they played basketball. They originally played basketball here, then moved to the field house, and then finally assembly hall. Um, so he coached right here. Um, during his time here, uh, one of the things I've always said about Coach Bell, and one of the things that impressed me when I came to clinics here and heard from him, is he could coach any event. I don't think there's an event in track and field that he wasn't capable of coaching and, and willing to coach. Um, and it kind of goes along with the idea that I think I'm quoting you, but I'm also quoting Dr. Councilman when I say that, you know, if you're going to be a coach, you need to know a little bit about everything, but then you need to be an expert in something. And uh, so he became an expert probably in middle distance coaching. That's where most of his notoriety came from. Uh, he's in his high school hall of fame. He's in Doan College Hall of Fame. He's in Oregon State University Hall of Fame. He's in, the, in Indiana University Hall of Fame. USA Track and Field Hall of Fame and uh, U.S. Track and Field Coaches uh, uh, Hall of Fame. I hope I didn't miss any. Uh, and, uh, uh, but while he was here at Indiana, I, I could name most of them, but uh, he had a number of sub four minute milers, starting with a, a guy named uh, Steve Heidenreich, uh, Mark Deedy, uh, James Murphy, barely broke it, um, uh, Terry Brom, uh, Jim Spivey, that many of you probably heard that name, uh, who made uh, uh, three Olympic teams. Uh, Dee Dee made an Olympic team. Uh, and of course, Bob Kennedy uh, was probably the most recent one uh, that, that broke four minutes. And he wasn't really a miler. He was more of a 5,000 meter guy anyway. So uh, I've asked him to come in, and, and this is very informal. He'll talk about whatever he wants. You ask what, what, whatever questions you want. Uh, as a high school kid, basketball was my favorite sport. Uh, I had a backboard on, a, on the side of a chicken house on the farm and uh, went out and shot the ball for hours. Uh, the high school I went to for three years did not play football until my last year there. Uh, they were in a conference that played baseball in the fall. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, the war was on World War II, and uh, there were no men around. And they finally hired a guy to come in and be the superintendent of schools and teach classes in the high school and uh, be the coach for all sports. And uh, he had you, uh, he had the team. He'd meet with the team and have them elect a captain. That's the last time you'd see him, except on competition days. <coughs> and uh, he, uh, Barney Metzger, he was the case. And uh, and my last year, I went to high school at a, county, at a county seat that we lived in that county. And uh, it turns out, uh, when, when my 50th high school or graduation year, the people at the last high school I went to had a reunion. 
and I went to it, and the people from the other high school heard I was going to be there and asked us all to come, come and go to breakfast with them. And at that breakfast, I asked them how many people graduated in that class from the first school I went to, and they said six. <laughs> it would probably have been 10 to 15 except for the war. <coughs> uh, some of them left early and more students in the first place. Uh, and the other, the uh, second high school I went to had 61 kids in the graduating class. A big school. Uh, and I was just out there. Uh, the uh, class met for its 65th anniversary of high school graduation. And uh, I was just there this last week. And uh, so uh, I played football, I played baseball in the first high school, and then they, we had a six-man football team my last year there, and uh, then I played basketball and ran track. And uh, at that size school, if you could walk and chew bubble gum, you're a great athlete. And uh, so I was probably the best athlete in school. Uh, that's not saying much, but it's the way it was. <coughs> and uh, uh, I, I, gradu I, I was 17 in March, graduated in May, joined the Navy in June, this was in 1945, and, uh, and the war ended in August. <coughs> uh, I was sent to Cornell University, I joined the Naval B-5 program, which was Naval Air Cadets, and you had to get a college degree before you could fly. And uh, so they sent me to Cornell, and then the war ended, and a bunch of us there were in that program, we all decided that we didn't want to stay in because that's not why we came in, was to do a peacetime military thing. <coughs> and so uh, uh, we, a bunch of us transferred to general duty and got discharged uh, late that next summer. So I was in 13 months. And uh, it's been about, uh, I guess, 12 weeks at Cornell. We went to Great Lakes Naval Training Station for boot camp, and the only thing we did in boot camp was one week we did shell, or do the other way, we didn't do anything. And uh, and then when I left, uh, when I left left boot camp, they sent me to Washington D.C. because they were bringing any personnel available who could type to Washington to process all the things that were going on, with discharges and all that sort of thing. And uh, so I was in Washington D.C. for about uh, seven months, I guess. And uh, worked in the uh, bureau. Of, worked worked in the um, naval annex across from Arlington National Cemetery. And you may not have heard of that, but it's something that most people in the U.S. have. And uh, uh, we lived in an old waves barrack. Uh, and the waves were Coast Guard women. And it was uh, two blocks from the National Cathedral in Washington D.C. And every day we'd take a bus over across the river and. Uh, go by the Lincoln Memorial and Arlington Cemetery and go to the Naval Annex and, and work. Uh, I was a farm kid in Nebraska and pretty protected as far as real life was concerned, I guess, but I, I learned a lot doing, uh, going through the jackets of the people I was doing, uh, processing to get aid for their families. Uh, things like common law marriage, which I didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> it was just one example of something. There were a lot of things in, in those in those packets that created an education. Uh, and I went back to a small school in Nebraska, and uh, I graduated graduated from there in three years in one summer school. And uh, left school one year because I uh, I was about to run out of GI Bill, and I went out to San Diego where my brother was working in the post office, and he got me a job in the post office. So I carried mail in San Diego for a year. And uh, it, uh, that was an education too because it was a coastal town and at that time San Diego had a lot of streets that did it and did nothing and yeah, it was hunting, peck and finding where you were going. <laughs> but uh, uh, I eventually, I carried uh, special delivery letters at night when I first started. But I eventually became a food carrier. And then when I came back to school I played football and ran track and Dolan. Uh, had a great coach there <coughs> who was from a small town in Nebraska and uh, he'd been a real good athlete at Dolan College and uh, he was very enthusiastic and a promoter. Uh, he really promoted sports. So one thing he did that it was in track and field, he started what were called the Dolan Night Relays and they're still going on. <coughs> and uh, uh, a, a variety of small colleges came to those. 
Uh, but he made a big deal out of it, and as a result, the community did. And uh, he eventually left Doan and went to Billings, Montana, was the director of athletics there for until he died. Uh, and uh, my first job out of college was at a little school in southern Nebraska. Uh, interesting sidelight. There's a book called uh, Sing Them Home that my wife has just finished reading. <coughs> And it's about the Welsh people who settled in southeast Nebraska and why more Nebraska is in the book, which I thought was kind of interesting. <coughs> the sing them home is when people died, they would sing until they brought the womb for burial. And uh, uh, it was a Welsh group. And uh, my wife saw <coughs> elementary education for, for two years there. She was a fourth grade teacher. And I actually had every kid in high school in class because I taught two classes of freshman English, uh, world history, American history, a senior class of problems, democracy, and coach football, basketball, and track. And uh, so uh, uh, every kid in high school had to take those classes, and so I had every one of them. Uh, I went to a, with this school. I'd, I'd been offered some jobs in six-man football in Nebraska, and I didn't want to do that because I thought it would be a dead end on where I could go coaching-wise. And so I took this job at Wymore, and they hadn't won a football game in three years, or a basketball game in four. And the uh, guy who had been the coach there had the kid in football, cross-body blocking in the line. Uh, he'd never heard of a, somebody go out and the body with their shoulders. And, and so it was a teaching of everything from beginning to end. And, uh, it's interesting, uh, we had the best athlete we had in school at the time was a freshman. His name was Steve Collier. And uh, about uh, four years ago, I got a call one day at home, and uh, the boy said, this is Steve Collier. And I said, Steve Collier from Wymore, Nebraska? That's me, he said. And he was uh, mature for his age, and was a good sprinter for a white kid, and uh, played tailback for us in football. And and uh, ran very well on track. But uh, he called out of the blue, uh, you know, 60 years later. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we talked a bit, and he was in Florida. And, and uh, I thought it was funny that I got that call. Uh, but uh, what you'll find if you coach at any level is it opens the door for you to be very important to those kids' lives <coughs> because you're kind of in an area that they want to be in. They want to cut, they want to play play whatever the, whatever the game is. And uh, uh, what you will find eventually, if your philosophy is right, is you're going to find that uh, you're coaching people. And the sport is a tool to coach people. And uh, you're going to find that you're their hero uh, when you're there, when you're with them. And uh, you're going to be the closest thing they have on the faculty. Uh, you're, you're going to be the person that's closest to their lives. And, uh, you know, people have different things that happen to them. But uh, when I was in high school, uh, a lot of people in my church and my mother tried to talk me into going into the ministry. And I thought about it seriously. And then they decided that uh, there was a better way to teach, to reach young people, and that was athletics. And uh, so I decided to become a coach. And my undergraduate major was in history and my, a teaching major in English and, and a minor in physical education because we didn't have a major in physical education at that small college. Uh, but uh, when I finally went to Oregon, uh, two years after I got out of college, uh, taught and coached two years at Wymore, Nebraska, uh, we moved to Oregon and I started graduate work and took a high school job there. Mm -hmm. And there I did teach physical education. Uh, but uh, I think back a lot to what's going on now with all the obesity you see in kids. And uh, I often, you know, they talk about no child left behind uh, with Bush and his administration, and it's not a situation of a child being left behind. Uh, I often want to ask those people, do you just send the mind to college, or does the body go with it, or to high school? And uh, I think people have lost sight of the fact that the body goes along with the brain. And 
there's a lot of the kids used to play a lot, and uh, they're now so locked into the organized sports and, and all of that sort of thing. It's not a lot of play, so they don't get a lot of physical activity unless they've got some athletic skills and they're involved in some kind of a team of some kind. And uh, what you see in the local papers that you guys have been here is uh, if the ball isn't round or oblong and doesn't bounce, they won't write about the sport. So you have real difficulty in finding what's going on in Dragon Field. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think that most of the people on, on the newspaper, local newspaper can spell track or field. And uh, <coughs> so I felt all along that whatever I did with the kids, it was important to get them publicity. And so I worked hard at that in uh, talking to local newspaper writers and and uh, when I got to college, I started calling the people in, or in Portland, Oregon, which is the big, biggest city in Oregon. And uh, they had two, news, two daily newspapers. <coughs> and uh, they actually had people who came to every one of our home track meets, both of them did. And uh, I don't think the kids on this newspaper now would even know where the track is. <coughs> and uh, you'd have to see how uh, dogs take them there. And uh, it's uh, if it doesn't, if you can't throw it or bounce it or shoot it, and it doesn't bounce, they're not going to cover it. But the only ball we have in track and field is fairly heavy, and it didn't bounce too well, you know. <laughs> but uh, the uh, uh, the thing that I would say to you philosophically is that whatever group you're working with as a coach. You need to understand that whether you want to be or not, you're going to be a role model. If you're out drinking in the bars, they'll be out drinking in the bars. Or they'll be getting illegal alcohol. Or they'll be finding drugs. <coughs> and uh, you have an impact on their lives to a point that maybe you don't want to, but you will have, good or bad, you'll have an influence on their lives. And uh, uh, so how you approach the sport as a part of a system will have a bearing on what their attitude is about the system and about about the sport. And uh, so if you're going to be in a school setting, college or high school, uh, you need to make them understand that studies are a vital part of what they're doing. They can't ignore that part of what's going on in education. And uh, you will be the most important educator they run into in their minds. And so it behooves you to conduct yourself in such a way that they would uh, want to use your role model. Uh, they would look to you for information and uh, <coughs> uh, know the skills of, of the sport you're coaching. Uh, and uh, you individually need to read as much as you can read uh, about the techniques in your sport and uh, how you go about teaching it what the basic skills are, and then you need to learn what those basic skills are. And depending on where you go, you could be the only coach in track and field if you coach track and field. You might have some assistance, but you might not. And uh, my first job, I didn't have an assistant in any sport. I coached, uh, everybody that was out, coached uh, junior varsity and varsity basketball teams and, and every, every event in track and field. And so I read a lot. And I also looked at other teams as, as we competed against them. Uh, I picked up a lot of ideas that other coaches were doing with the kids that they coached. And uh, you should watch those kinds of things because you, you'll find there's some things that other coaches can teach you without knowing it, just for what their kids are doing. And uh, I think that uh, if you're going to succeed as a coach, you need to be very observant. Uh, you need to be like a sponge and absorb everything you can. Uh, and uh, when I taught the, the track and field coaching class here when I was coaching, my first lecture was always on philosophy of coaching. <coughs> and uh, I told the kids, the first thing that I told them was that <coughs> if you never learn but one thing in your life and you learn that in education, you will have gotten an education. And that is to question authority. Because a lot of the stuff that you'll get and read is from people who don't know a darn thing about what they're writing about. 
And so you need to be critical of what you read. And then you need to be critical of you. Uh, you're the first authority that ought to be questioned. And uh, that, uh, along with that, along with that questioning and reading and looking and, and learning from the kids you have under your tutelage, uh, you will get an education that you didn't even know you were going to get. And uh, I think back uh, I, when they took the cross-country team into the Oregon State Hall of Fame several years ago, the kids were there, and we had a kid who won the NCAA Cross Country Meet that year, too. He was from Orange, California. And uh, uh, I made a comment <coughs> when I talked about it. Was, uh, I said, I learned a lot from Dale's story. Uh, because he was a kid who uh, was a free spirit. He'd go out and ride a bike 50 miles. And uh, Orange, Orange County, California, south of L.A., and uh, pretty heavily populated. <coughs> But uh, at that time, he had run 411 in high school, and then he went to junior college for a year. And he had told me, well, I'm going to go to junior college, then I'm going to Oregon State. And he wanted to major in fishing game management. <coughs> so he came to Oregon State, did major in fishing game management, won the NCAA cross-country meet. But one of the things that I, I learned from him in, in coaching was, I don't know how much you guys have been around track, some of them have been, but there's a thing in training distance runners called interval training. And uh, it comes from a, from a term that you take an interval of rest between sessions of what you do. You might be running 400s and you have a rest period that's called an interval. <coughs> well, uh, Dale Story would uh, run a four, at that time we were running yards. He'd run a 440, jog past the finish line, turn to the, and we are our finish line at that time was 20 yards from the curve. He jogged down the curve, turn and come back and start immediately as soon as he got back. And so I learned from him that uh, one of the best ways to make people improve is to cut down the rest period when you're running intervals. And you can do that progressively. You can start with one, one time of interval, and as time goes along, week by week, you can cut down that interval of rest. Uh, another way you can do it is to cut down the, the time that you're running. Uh, let's say you're running 400s. Uh, you tell them to run, uh, let's take a, an average high school kid. You tell them to run uh, 66 because they've run 424 in a mile. And that's a lap. And, uh, and then you keep cutting the rest down. <coughs> and uh, uh, one week you do, a, let's say you do a minute and 30 seconds rest. And then the next week you do a minute and 15, the next week you do a minute, and the next week you start running 65s and you go back up to the longer rest and, and keep coming down. <coughs> and uh, uh, there's a whole lot of things that, uh, there's so much material out there to read and you need to read it. And you need to read it critically because you need to say, Does, is this logical? And if it isn't logical, you throw it out. Uh, because there's a lot of things out there in print and people talking about things that aren't logical. <coughs> and uh, so I think that, uh, actually, I think that's true of everything you do with education. You need to analyze what people have written about history. And you, is it logical? Does it make sense that that happened or did, doesn't it make sense? And it goes with everything about your life. Um, but. Uh, I think that if, if you're going to coach, you need to determine how you're going to communicate with your athletes. And one thing you have to communicate is, what are you going to do in workouts? And today's world is so different than when I started. Computers have changed the world. And uh, uh, if, you, if you type, that was a miracle. <laughs> but uh, uh, I worked in Oregon, there was a coach in Oregon named Bill Bowerman <coughs> at Oregon, uh, a great coach, and uh, he developed a system of uh, taking events and put, putting them on a page and listing all the things they would do in workouts. And then he have a graph of three weeks that he would write stuff down for each day. Uh, and uh, I picked that up and changed it a lot and made a lot more detailed. But the concept was really valuable in 
being able to tell the kids what I wanted them to do, and I didn't have to go to each kid and say, okay, today we're going to do this because they have a workout sheet. And I made those workout sheets up. I started out doing them for a month, and then I did them for three weeks, and then I did them for two weeks, and then I went back to three weeks. And uh, if you're doing three weeks, you can progress from where you are to where you're going just by what you do on a workout plan. <coughs> and, uh, uh, and having a graphic that grew up and you put kids' names at the top of it, and sometimes you would have a whole bunch of kids on, on a workout sheet if they were in the same event area. And if you needed to make adjustments, you could make some kind of a comment, like if you had kids running 70 seconds for a quarter, and you had some kid that needed to be running 74 seconds, for example, because they weren't ready to run 70, 70 seconds, at the top of the sheet you could just put Joe run 70 seconds. And uh, <coughs> so uh, there are lots of ways. And I, I made some copies of a workout sheet that I thought I would give to you to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, this sheet has progressed a lot from when I first did it. It's to totally different. And uh, so I... Uh, <coughs> And he actually had sheets like this for every event. This, these are the distance sheets, but had them for all the field events and sprints as well. But you can see up the top, there's a bunch of things. And uh, number two is, uh, well, for number one, we always would run at, at least an 800, uh, easy to get the blood flowing. And then we do a lot of drills. Uh, what well, we do, stretching, stretching, and some. Uh, some exercise to get the heart beating with the arms. And then we do sprint drills. And uh, we would be critical of what they did, and, and uh, some of them broke down movement in the sections, uh, such as where does the heel go, uh, and uh, what's a fast leg, and what's high knee, and, and uh, some stationary drills. And, and so on and so forth, and then accelerations after we get done with the drills and, and go into the running workouts. And uh, you can see that there's spaces down here, and you can write numbers, and the reason I started with a Wednesday is a lot of times we have a weekend track meet, and uh, I wouldn't have time to get everybody's workout sheets done by Monday, and so we'd start the new sheet on Wednesday. And uh, <coughs> you have to look and see how you're organized, and and what you can accomplish to, to transmit information. But uh, those are, uh, uh, so that workout sheet would have numbers all across it. And they'd refer back to the number. <coughs> and uh, for example, uh, if I were going to uh, do some repeats, and let's say we're going to run 400s, I would write a 5E, and then I would put a dash and write the tempo of that. Any, anything from, you know, 60 to 70 seconds. And uh, uh, and then I would put parentheses and I, that, that would list what they're going to rest. Usually it's time rest, the way I did things. Some people rest distance. They rest a 220 or 440 or, or uh, whatever. But uh, anyway, you can as, as the sheet worksheet progresses, then you can cut those rest periods down to make the workout harder <coughs> and make them make progress. And uh, the other thing I would tell you is that uh, a lot of coaches in track and field uh, say, go run. They say, go run this or go run that. <coughs> uh, if you're going to coach, you need to teach the technique of running. And you need to understand why you te teach that technique. What is it? And uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, if you look at your body and think about your body, what's the foot? It's a shock absorber. What's the ankle? It's a shock absorber. What's the knee? It's a shock absorber. What's the hip? It's a shock absorber. And so you need to integrate those shock absorption things in the lower body to make it possible for runners to do more and not get hurt. Now, what would it be like if you went out and drove a car with no shock absorbers? It'd jar you to death. And that's what happens for people who don't put the foot down right. 
uh, who overstride and land way out in here with the heel. <coughs> and so you need to think about that. And and uh, Bowerman, who was a great coach at Oregon, used to say, well, if you if you uh, don't land on your heel, you're running on the toes. Well, he had thought that thing through very well. But uh, <coughs> you do need to run where the ball of the foot strikes first. And if you look at your foot, there's a whole series of shock absorbers in it. And you need to let that foot go down as soft as you can. And then the heel will drop, but it'll just barely touch, and then come, the whole foot will come back up again. And so you need, to, you need to teach your kids how to put a foot down and take the jar out of, out of what you're getting from the ground as your foot strikes the ground or the, or the track. <coughs> and uh, that's why you do those drills. And you emphasize that while they're doing the drill. And uh, another thing, uh, if you're really interested in running, you need to watch. Uh, every time you see somebody on the street running, you need to look at them and be critical of what they're doing So, because that's how you learn to coach. <coughs> and uh, uh, the thing that happens a lot of times, uh, you'll see a heel come across the midline of the body when it picks up. And that creates a rotation in the hips, and instead of going this direction, they're going like this. Uh, you need to be sure you what you see as you watch is that the foot should go straight ahead. It shouldn't be out like this, play footed. It should be right ahead, and it shouldn't be pigeon toed uh, because that's putting an undue stress on the lower leg. And so uh, you constantly talk to them about foot positioning, about what goes to the surface you're running on first. And, uh, and where the heel, where the heel goes. So you keep things in line. You don't. Well, I'll tell you a little story of that. Uh, in 1964, uh, we had a kid on our team who set an American record in 800 meters. Uh, it wasn't run very much, but he set an American record in 800 meters. And he was our first. He's the first sub four minute miler I had. He ran 357.9. And. Uh, uh, he made the Olympic team in 64 in the 800. In fact, in that Olympic trials, we had kids that were 1, 4, and 5 in the, in the 800 meter in the final race. And uh, uh, the, uh, the kid who made the Olympic team was a kid named Morgan Groth. And I really think he would have been the Olympic champion uh, if I hadn't made a mistake. Uh, he wore a shoe that Adidas made at that time called the Interval, and it had a raised heel on it, a deep heel. And uh, it was a spike with a raised heel. Yeah. And uh, uh, just well, he had one one workout left, work on the track in Tokyo, when I, before I took a day off, went down to Kyoto, and uh, that day he put on his meat spikes and didn't run in the, in the interval training shoe. And he hurt his Achilles tendon, which he'd had a problem with before. And uh, as a result, he didn't get out of the trials. Uh, I really feel that he would have beaten Peter Snell in the, in the Olympics if, if that hadn't happened. And I kicked myself <coughs> for going to Kyoto. <laughs> but uh, uh, he was a great, great, great talent. And uh, uh, But he hurt the Achilles tendon because he did not protect it in training. And so you need to look at a lot of different things. And the shoes that they train in may not be what they race in. And uh, he never wore his racing shoes in workouts. He just wore the interval. But why I left and wasn't there when he, he ran, he did that. And uh, so uh, there's so many things that go into to putting things together. And then I was, somebody here said they played soccer. Okay, yes, sir. Well, the greatest thing about soccer is it's a great lead-up sport for track. They run intervals constantly. They run and rest, and they run and rest. Uh, it's a dumb game. You can't even use a thing that's most natural for you to use your hands. <laughs> they penalize if you use your hands. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a worldwide game because they play on the street, they play in an alley, they play in the yard, they don't have to have facilities. And so it's a, it's a natural game for the societies of the world, really. Uh, everybody doesn't have the athletic facilities we have in this country. And uh, so uh, the, 
thing that I would share with you is that in track and field for distance kids, uh, unless they're playing another sport in the fall, they should be running cross country. Of course, that's a time that they build the endurance base. And uh, uh, it, uh, I would share with you, if you're going to coach, you need to have your kids keep a diary. They need to record <coughs> what they did every day in a workout. Uh, how fast they ran, what kind of rest they took, <coughs> and what the volume was. And uh, they can look back a month or two months or three months later and say, well, I was doing this here. Well, there's a, there's a thing about most sports, but certainly it's true in drug abuse. You need to under you need to lay a base of endurance so that you can eventually do uh, intense work. And uh, so cross country running in the fall for distance kids is a must. But if they're going to do well in cross country, they got to run in the summer too. And so I always send our kids a summer workout program that was progressive. Uh, from sometime in late June or early June, depending on when their season was over, uh, until the first of September. <coughs> and so when they came in, that's that is the groundwork for having a cross country team is to build a base of running in the summer months, and that base in, in involves volume and a little bit of, of stress workouts, but not a lot. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the one thing I tell people is you should never get away from speed work in uh, distance running. And that means that you may be running hills. That's, that's sprint work because you have to shorten the stride and use the arms hard and, and all that. And, uh, and then uh, you can do, uh, well, we, we used to call them surges, but you can, you can run uh, along at a given pace and then surge by increasing the tempo and uh, forcing the uh, people with you to do the same thing and if they aren't used to that you're going to kill them before they get to the point where they have a chance to beat you at the finish line. Uh, but uh, sprint drills will also teach the kids how to run and it'll teach you to put things in line and uh, uh, if, if you've got a kid who's play footed you need to work on it having him run pigeon toed. So he overcorrects and learns how to get the foot in line with, with the rest of the leg. And uh, uh, and then they need to learn that the heel, the faster you run, the higher the heel comes up. It'll come up and hit you, hit you in the boot. Uh, you know, the heel will actually touch the buttocks and uh, in, in great sprinters. And you need to tie in the arm action because the whole body is running it in just the legs. And uh, you need to get the arms in sync with what's happening down below. And uh, you need to remember that wherever you create tension in your body, it's going to go to other parts of the body. And so if you're out there with your fist balled up, you're going to create tension on the lower arm and the upper arm and the shoulders and eventually into the back and the legs. And so this needs to be relaxed. And you need to put your hands at the side and look at them. And when you pull the hands up, they should be in exactly the same position they are when they're down here relaxed. And as you move, that they will stay there. They won't move like this, and and uh, uh, or like this. So you see, people do a lot of things, but the, the hands need to be loose, and they need to go forward and back in conjunction with what the legs are doing. And uh, if you watch a distance runner compared to a sprinter, you're going to you're going to see the hands of a distance runner drop down closer to the hip, and uh, maybe sometimes a little bit behind the hip and the elbow will open up. And then when the hand comes up, the elbow will close and the hand will come up. And when they just start running faster, their hand will get up by the face. And sprinters' hands are always up by the face when they're running and the hands, and good sprinters are relaxed. And you're not boxing yourself. You're just getting that motion going where you want to go. And uh, uh, I think back of talking about sprinting and one thing or another and, and staying in line. Uh, Coach Henson uh, worked with the Gill Athletic 
company developing a starting block which has been used in the Olympic Games. Uh, our net starting block used to be what everybody used. It had a long base and a narrow base and then it had two feet that fit in the slots. <coughs> and uh, uh, I always had our kids put their feet on the outside of those starting blocks so that when they stepped forward they would go straight ahead. They wouldn't go out here for balance. And it, the more narrow your feet are in the starting blocks, the more you're going to step out to, because you're not going to step out and, and use a technique where you'll stumble. And so you need to teach the kids uh, to go straight ahead and then where the foot is on the block does that. Well, Coach Henson developed a wider base for the blocks to move back and forth in. And uh, so uh, he ended up with the, feet, with the feet in line with the shoulders in the locks. And so their, their first step is here, and the second step is here. They're not here and here to regain balance. And if you ever get into a situation where you don't have starting blocks that are wide, then you need to get some if you can. If you can't tell the kids to put their feet on the outside of the box That's so that the action is going to go where they're going to go. And it's not going to go out the right and left field. And uh, uh, so that, that he made a real contribution with that. Um, but uh, I'm just trying to think of what else I could do here. <coughs> Didn't make any money off of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> he gave my, away. Yeah, my, <laughs> my son just finished law school. He's real uh, unhappy with me. He said, you did, shouldn't have given that away, <laughs> your idea of the way. Yeah. Well, you do, um, what you do in our sport is you give ideas as well as I to try to make it work better. <laughs> I, that's that. um, we we got plenty of time here, but I, I was going to say, you might talk a little bit about your comment sheet. And I, I can get them a copy if you want. Uh, or because I think when you talk about communication, I think your comment sheet yeah. was one of the most important things you ever came up with. Well, uh, I uh, after every meet, first of all, we would have managers who would take splits. Uh, they would get a split at the 400 or at the 200 or whatever, and record it for each kid that ran. And uh, you need a lot of managers to do that. We try to get a lot of managers. But uh, they would record what everybody's split was, for example, at a 200 or a 400, or whatever. And uh, uh, in hurdles, we would get a split when the foot hit the ground off the hurdle. And uh, uh, so at the end, I would take that and, and uh, give it to a secretary. Uh, eventually, I did it by hand for a long time. But uh, uh, they would type type that stuff up, and and so they would. I handed out at at the first day after a track meet. I would hand out a splits and comments sheet, and the splits were the splits and the events they competed in, or the series and the throws of, uh, of what happened. <coughs> and uh, uh, they can go back and look and say, well, this led to this, and. Uh, the most effective way to run distances is to uh, ration the effort equally from start to finish. And so if you're going to run two minutes and a half mile in that 800 meters, then each 200 should be 30, uh, should, uh, should be 30 seconds. And, uh, and if that's what you're trying to accomplish and get those splits, they can tell whether they've done that or they overrun or underrun or whatever. And it's a teaching tool. And so uh, we would do the, the splits. We'd time the foot on the ground off of every hurdle. Uh, if they were running a 200, we tried to get the 100 split. If they're running a 400, we tried to get a 100, 200, 300 split. <laughs> so they can see how the race is broken down. And you can then coach them. And uh, if an equal effort is going to make you faster, then you try to teach them how to run that equal effort. There will be some exceptions that will happen in that regard. For example, in the 400, uh, if a guy is going to run 44 seconds, uh, you won't see him running 22 seconds in the first 200. It's going to be faster. And eventually he's going to run sl slower on his last 100. But uh, you need to work on those kinds of things where they become conscious of what's important and what is The other thing that I did, and, and one of the things that's tragic for our sport is 
uh, most track meets now are time trials. You don't keep score. What was the score? What would you keep score? What would a basketball game be exciting to if you didn't keep score? What would you keep score? And so uh, it's important, I think, to make the kids responsible to each other and to the team in keeping score. Uh, the result, uh, the outcome is the result of what the, the total team has done. And uh, so I would list high point people, non-scorers, uh, and then the, the next thing I would do is I would list uh, personal records, uh, season records, uh, and uh, on and on, and and, uh, and then I would list uh, <coughs> I would list disappointments. And so it's there for the whole team to see. It's a, it's a team situation that you're dealing with. And so you make people accountable. And uh, the uh, University of Nebraska at one time was a very, very good track school with a coach who had a lot of scoring weeks. And he was a great high jump coach. But but uh, he had good teams, and I got them to come here one time for a dual meet. <coughs> and when the mile relay came up, which was the last event of the night, uh, our kids were all around the track yelling at the relay runners. Uh, they were a part of what the relay team was doing. And uh, he came up and said, boy, I can't believe how your kids are into that relay. Well, we won the meet, and we shouldn't have. Now, on paper, we didn't win the meet before it started. But we won the meet. We won it fairly uh, easily. But uh, you get your, your team to do things that influence the rest of the team. The individuals influence the rest of the team. Now whatever you can do to create that atmosphere is going to pay off in the end. And uh, so we go in and we have a Saturday meeting. We go in Monday for practice, and I, I would have the handout sheets there with all, all the splits and comments and, and all of that sort of thing. They wouldn't practice till they got it. Uh, they wanted to read that, so they'd all sit down, read the comment split sheet first, and then be ready to go. And lots of times, some kids would come up and say, well, why wasn't I on the disappointment list? Well, I saw something that maybe they didn't see in themselves, or they were trying to be self-abusive because they didn't want to do what they wanted to do. But uh, uh, you, you create situations where the team becomes a part of each other. And they, uh, they know who the shot putters are if they're sprinters or distance runners. And the shot putters know who the high jumpers and long jumpers are and who the runners are. And they're all intermixed and they know what each person is contributing and how important it is for them to uh, put the best foot forward and do what they're capable of doing and, and not create a hole that can't be replaced. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a coaching tool as well as a motivating tool because the things that you say to them are things they take and carry. I had a kid that, at Oregon State who uh, I didn't even know him. It was my first year of coaching at, on the college level and I'd had this kid who set a national high school mile record and this kid, kid comes to the office and says he wanted to go out for track and and uh, he had run a 203 high school 880, which is not good. And he had run uh, 431 in the mile, which is not good. Now, when you've had a kid that had a national high school mile record of 411. And uh, <coughs> so you don't even know about him. But he was from Oregon, and he came in and he came in and wanted to run. Well, he's a kid <coughs> that ran 148 in college, and he ran 401. And uh, he was fourth in the Olympic trials in 1964 in the 800. And uh, uh, after he graduated, he came back and spent a fifth year with us. And that next year, he ran 147.4. Uh, but he was also helping his coach. And uh, he finished the Masters. And, and he's another interesting story in the fact that he came to school. And he was. And I, I, I sent out grade checks. We didn't have a academic advisory situation then, but I sent out grade checks every every uh, couple of weeks, and they would return them to me and tell, tell me how many absences the kids had and what the grades were and, and all that, and we'd have sessions about that. 
but he came in one day uh, in his uh, spring some spring quarter. We were in quarters, spring quarter of his freshman year, and he said, "I'm going to quit school because I don't like what I'm going to." He decided to major in PE, and uh, so we talked and about what he did like, and he ended up majoring in biology, and uh, uh, graduated with uh, about a three five, and. Uh, became a, a great runner and he was on the world record team in the 4x880 and uh, so uh, when he graduated and finished graduate school I'd had a graduate assistant here before who had run for Kansas and uh, he uh, ended up being hired at Bakersfield Community College in Bakersfield, California and uh, <coughs> he only coached there for 42 years <laughs> had great teams but uh, he uh, hired Norm, Norm Hoffman is his kid's name, to come to Bakersfield as an assistant coach and also teach health education because he'd gotten a master's in health education. And uh, uh, he, I saw him one time, I mean, it's his coach, I've got a, every handout sheet you ever handed out. Uh, those comment sheets are important to the athlete. And they go back and look at them and, and it, the history of what they've done bears fruit for what they will do, and uh, uh, it motivates them to do better than they've done in the past. Well, he could have kept every one of those. And uh, so uh, uh, it was a, it's an educational situation, it's a coaching situation, and it's a motivating situation. So whatever you can do to communicate with your kids, it's important. And another thing that we did, we actually had sports writers who would write about what we had done. <coughs> and uh, put results in the paper and copies of those results will also be on the handout sheet and so there's a whole lot of things and I'll tell you kids like to see their name in print mm -hmm. they do, regardless of where it is and uh, whether it's good or bad they want to see their name the worst thing you do is leave their name off yeah. you know they, they'd rather be on the disappointment list <laughs> right. than be ignored yeah. Yeah.